in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, October 6th, and we will be hearing the presentation, Integrating Lead ND and Sites into Your Planning Approach. For technical help during today's webcast, please type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown. And for your content questions, type those in the questions box, again, located in the webinar toolbar. We'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2017. Thanks to all of those sponsors for participating and making these webcasts possible to their members. If you're looking down the list and you don't see your chapter or division listed, we just ask that you reach out to them and tell them to join us. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the National Capital Area Chapter of APA, and you can learn more about them by visiting ncac-apa.org. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these webcasts by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your MyAPA account. Then you can search for CM activities either by today's title or the event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education, and you can check those out on our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcasts. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, and we'll pop up. And we'll have a PDF of the presentation available at the end of the session on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. So with that, I am going to turn it over to today's speakers to get us started. Hi, my name is uh, Joshua Sloan, and I'm the uh, Vice President with VICA Maryland LLC. I also direct our Planning and Landscape Architecture Department. Um, I'm a lead AP in, in neighborhood development and a sites AP, so of course I have the particular interest in these topics. And I'll let Steve Cook introduce himself. And I, I'm Steve Cook. I work with Josh at Vica as well. And I'm a senior landscape architect here, uh, a lead AP, and have been involved with um, USGBC and sites as a technical advisor in the development of the, both rating systems. So here's our agenda. Um, introductions was, of course, the two of us, but we'll also be asking a couple uh, polling questions to learn a little bit about our audience and try to tailor things to those, those folks a little bit more in detail. Then we're going to go through lead for neighborhood development and sites, a little introduction for those who don't have any background in the rating systems then talk a little bit about design process, a sustainability framework. It's sort of a work in progress for our office, but we use it in different projects when we're doing um, sustainability approaches to our design and our planning of those projects. Then we're going to look at a little more detail for different credit comparisons from each of the uh, rating systems. 
So that'll give you a little bit more of a, a dive into what these credits are all about and how to start looking at things as you work them into your planning and design approach. Then, of course, we've got our time for questions. So we're going to start with a quick polling question, and that is, what professional green credentials do you have, whether it's LEED AP and D, if it's CITES AP, uh, both of those, some other LEED or green certification, or if you don't have any? I'm not really sure how long these last, but we'll... Uh, we'll give it a few more moments. Pop. We have about 50% okay. voted so far. Wow. That's quick. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it up and we'll show. Sharing poll organizers must hide poll results. So, what do I do on this side? Is there anything I need to do to share the poll results? Everyone can see them um, except for you. <laughs> so, lead APND okay. is 3%. Um, 13% other lead, and 84% is none. Okay. So we'll we'll try to cover things in a little bit more detail then, than we might typically do. The other thing we want to address is um, the different professions. I assume most people are planners. Um, I'm actually a landscape architect by training, but after seven years of public practice, also became a planner. Um, and we might have some that are planners and architects or engineers. I didn't put a combined, but I assume we'll get a 100% on two. <laughs> Very close. So maybe if you're if you're not only a planner but also something else, you could put that. We'll give it another moment here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it and um, I'll share those results. So 4% landscape architect, 88% planner, 2% architect, 1% engineer, and 5% other. Hmm, cool, okay. So we're going to start with, with lead for neighborhood development, an overview of that. So this is a, a project that uh, we worked on in this office. It's a project in White Flint, which is just north of Bethesda in, in Montgomery County, Maryland, called Pike and Rose. It's a lead ND project. And like all lead projects, these are this is a rating system that really focuses on the impacts of climate change, improving human health and well-being, addressing water resources, primarily through conservation and stormwater uh, systems, improving biodiversity, protecting biodiversity, and improving and protecting ecosystem services. It also deals a lot with material resources, such as where you're getting your materials from, if they're locally sourced, if they're sustainable, those kind of issues. The green economy, uh, all of LEED is trying to promote green materials, green jobs, and then also equity, justice, and quality of life issues, such as affordable housing and input from the community in the design process. Some of the benefits of LEED ND, um, this is a project uh, which is an older project. Um, you might recognize it. It's part of Radburn, which is up in New Jersey, which is an early planned community that has many of the benefits that LEED ND does, although it um, was marketed, I guess, as the first uh, suburban auto-oriented 
uh, project, but that is scale. Lead ND is for large areas typically. You have to have at least two buildings in your project, and most are significant areas of downtown development. It's comprehensive. It has a lot of synergies between the individual lead programs, such as uh, new construction or, or sites. And it also has longevity built into its rating system. So these are projects that stand the test of time, such as Radburn. There are several program requirements for LEAD ND. First, it has to be on permanent location on existing land. This can't be something like a infill of a harbor area or something such as, as done in, in New York, um, things like that. It has to have what they call reasonable lead boundaries. Uh, typically, that is some kind of right-of-way or property boundary, although it can be broken up a little bit into different areas, and you can decide to incorporate public rights-of-way or not. And it has some project size requirements. There's, there's no minimum size, except that you have to have two buildings, and it can't be more than, I think it's several hundred acres. There are two ways to approach a lead ND project. The first is what's called lead ND plan. And for that, you start your certification when you're in the planning stage, in the design stage itself, or you're less than 75% constructed. So you can't be fully built out. And this is really to, because it involves the design process, it involves community outreach, and it involves other aspects that you don't that, that you need to incorporate before you actually start building. The other is lead ND built project, and that's a project that goes back for certification after it's completed. Uh, this is a second phase of one project that's partially built out called uh, North Bethesda Market, again in White Flint. This was really a testing area for a lot of these projects several years ago. Um, when I was working for the Montgomery County Planning Department, I worked with several developers and uh, design teams on implementing these projects. This was a lead ND plan for their second phase, which still isn't built at all. Um, and some projects go on and they get certifications in both. Like all lead projects, it has several categories. There are only a few for lead ND. Uh, this is a project, um, this is near a project up in Boston. It wasn't built when I was there, um, but just down the street from this uh, is a really neat project that's getting started. And they, this shows the points that they obtained to, to get a gold rating for lead ND in the different categories. Smart location and linkage is just what it sounds like. That's where you're on infill sites, previously developed sites, where you're near transit and basic services, things like that. Neighborhood pattern design and design, that's about how you're laying out your street pattern, making sure that there's a lot of connectivity, that uh, there's building orientation is taken into consideration, those kind of aspects. Green infrastructure and buildings, those are really the built elements, whether it's the buildings themselves are getting certified to at least a lead a new, what is it, new N, N, D, and C? BDNC. BDNC. Or sometimes core and shell. Or sometimes core and shell. So you have to have certified buildings, or at least a certain percent of them. And then green infrastructure will be things like stormwater and how you're doing your paving, tree plantings. There are innovation credits, and the, those are categories where you can actually come up with some ideas where you can do performance better than other credits are required. And then there's regional priority credits. Typically, most jurisdictions have areas where they're trying to focus redevelopment, TOD types of things. Maryland has a very strong smart growth program, and you can obtain regional priority credits by focusing in those areas. So SITES is, is quite different. SITES is really focused on um, ecosystem services. This is a project near us called Evans, Evans Parkway Neighborhood Park. You can see in the lower right a channelized stream that's just north of the, the larger picture. And this channelized stream was restored to a, its natural state. And you can obviously 
see that there are a lot of ecological benefits that come along with this, the habitat, the stormwater issues, the air and water quality. So there are three or four primary goals for sites. It's focused on regenerative systems and resiliency so that you can deal with flooding issues and things like the channelized stream could not deal with as effectively. Resource supply and climate change. This is dealing with issues of soils, forests, streams, and the overarching issue of climate change that we're all focusing on. Market transformation. Again, that's a way to bring the green economy into our design thinking so that we're providing not only green jobs, but starting to focus nurseries to provide native species. And that's been a big thing that we've been working on with certain nurseries that provide us with species that are much more adapted to our areas, don't require as much irrigation, those kind of things. And then individual and community well-being. That's a, a focus to really get our, our design thinking about the user, the end user in this process. And they're brought in early in the project to start thinking about how they can benefit. Some of site's benefits, this is an American University School for International Service, I think it's called. And they did a site's project around one of their new campus building. Some of the benefits that they're seeing, um, it's really bringing best practices in sustainable design to landscape design planning of, of, of sites. It's because this is also was developed by the American Society of Landscape Architects along with the United States Botanic Gardens and Lady Bird Johnson, which is a, in University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we have a health safety welfare part of our licensing requirement that we need to focus on, and this brings that to the forefront. It sets certain sustainability standards for our industry, and there are performance measurements and things that are starting to be developed for specific design elements. Marketability, a lot of places are using this like they do use LEED to market their sites. And ethics, there's our specifically our focus on sustainability ethics as well as equity, um, environmental justice issues. Sites program requirements are not too uh, prohibitive. You have to be, uh, be designing a new project or doing a major renovation. It can't be simply a maintenance project or a minor renovation. There's no maximum area for a site program. It typically takes up a, a park area, um, sometimes a greenway that's a little bit larger, but it can go down to as small as 2,000 square feet, and some private residences have, become, have gotten certified. The Anacostia watershed was an early, early um, adopter of the sites program. I think they were actually one of the test cases, and they did a major renovation of their site to focus on stormwater because they are right outside of the Anacostia River, which is uh, runs through DC um, and Prince George's County in Maryland. There are several sites categories, um, a little more expansive than LEED ND. There's site context, that's much like the LEED ND location type of elements. That's uh, infill sites, pre developed sites, location near transit, those kind of things. Pre design assessment and planning is a large part of the site's project. You need to start thinking very early on about your design process and the design responsibilities. Who's going to be looking at specific issues like ecologists and biologists are brought in quite early in a lot of our projects that, that follow this uh, framework. Um, we also work very early with engineers on floodplain stormwater issues and other, other pieces of the puzzle. Site design water is focused primarily on stormwater, but also on reducing water use on the site by using native plants, using drip irrigation systems, using cisterns that capture rainwater for your, for your irrigation. So site design soil and vegetation is, of course, focused on uh, the primary aspect of what landscape architects focus on, the plant material and the soils that support them. 
and it's much more detailed than any other lead project or leads rating system or, or rating system that we've seen on soil health where the majority of carbon sequest sequestration really occurs in a lot of these sites. Site design material selections, that is sourcing locally using materials with recycled materials, hopefully post-consumer, and reducing the amount of um, waste that leaves your site when you're actually constructing. Site design human health and well-being is focusing on the, the end user, improving air and water quality, access to green elements from your office, windows, those kind of things. This is, the, the picture is the uh, sustainable site, um, oops, let's see if we just turn it off. Our TV automatically turns off when it doesn't think anything's happening, even though it is, so just take us a second. So the picture is a uh, up at the Phipps Conservatory, the Sustainable Landscape Center. That's what it's called. And this, this is a brilliant project that achieved sites gold, lead, platinum, well, well building, and several other things when it was built. A couple other categories. This is their green roof, um, a beautiful intensive green roof with a lot of plant species overlooking Pittsburgh. So also construction is taken into consideration, operations and maintenance. So it looks very, very far down the road into how the site is actually going to be maintained. And then the, the two bullets in parentheses, there are no prerequisites for these categories, um, but the, you can get points by providing education and outreach, by setting up performance monitoring for water quality or biodiversity or things like that and then innovation exemplary performance for your project. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to talk a little bit about the crosswalks that are available that compare the different rating systems. But we have another polling question on whether or not you've worked on any lead ND or sites projects. OK, and I went ahead and launched that. So folks, go ahead and put in your poll. Give it another moment. Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and close it. And I'll share those results. Uh, okay. Lead ND, 11%. Sites, 2%. Both, 3%. Neither, 72%. Other uh, lead projects, 12 percent. Okay. All right. So this is uh, just a, a typical graphic of you know what a site's boundary might look like. You can see that it generally falls follows um, you know the legal property boundary, but it excludes uh, a small operational facility that wasn't part of of this overall project. And, and clearly, you can see here there's a you know a large environmental feature that's that's being preserved. And, and again, that's sites is big focus, especially on, on sites that are predominantly native. Um, you can see also that uh, you know this this particular exhibit you know identifies prime farmland, brownfield areas, floodplains, and a, a term that may be new to some of you. It's it's uh, sprinkled throughout the sites rating system of VSPZ. That's vegetation and soil protection zones. This is where the sites rating system really dives deeper into more specificity, specificity regarding the soil's health and soil quality because that's you know the foundation for the support of a lot of wildlife and plants. Um, this is a, your typical you know a typical look of a of a lead ND boundary. Uh, you can see how it it includes you know all of all of the right of ways that are within it. 
it may exclude some parcels for, for various reasons, but, but in general, you can see the variability. This includes, you know, a lot of property lines, a lot of parcels, and it is possible and has happened that, that you have, you know, a, a site project within a lead in the project. Um, location, some of the, some of the differences in, in the location are that, you know, sites looks at distances in terms of walking distances or biking distances on radial measurements as, as the crow flies, if you will, whereas lead in D is, is walking distance or biking distance. So that's some of the, some of the challenges in, in translating one to the other if you're, if you're trying to combine credits on both projects. Now, this past September, uh, GBCI, which is uh, the Green Building Certification Institute, and, and GBCI is uh, independent of USGBC or any of the rating systems. It's generally a, a certification and credentialing body for many rating systems, such as LEED, SITES, WELL, GRESD. Uh, they, you know, they, they're somewhat international and in, in, uh, bringing some of the, some of the uh, many rating systems that are out there. Um, but what GBCI did, and, and they, they do this routinely with a lot of different rating systems, they developed these crosswalks. And this was a crosswalk done for LEED, ND, and sites that was, that was submitted to USGBC this past September. Uh, this, this recommended motion is currently under review by USGBC, but eventually this, these, these uh, sites will have direct synergies, where, which it prevents teams from having to prepare documents for both rating systems. So one will lead the other, and some are some are uh, like this shows as a, a full substitution, and you can get a, a general look at, at how common some of them are. And, and in this particular situation, uh, one rating system has a little more rigor than the other, so it automatically earns earns the, the opposite rating system. So this this shows how lead and D earn sites, and this one shows how sites. Uh, would learn, learn lead in D. Okay. And so, do you want to say anything else? No, that's it. Okay. So another another question we have. One of the things we typically do when we're working on these projects is we try to get the client to bring in folks early, uh, not only the design professionals, but also sustainability professionals. And as I noted, we work with several ecologists, um, some biologists that focus on natural science and sustainability issues. And, and now and again, we'll get a client who's interested in bringing in someone who's focused on health and well-being, especially dealing with buildings that have things like daycare, or healthcare in them. It's a bit different than your typical kickoff meeting because we're really looking at the bigger issues and the longer term sustainability of the project. We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and close it down. And let's see, 74% uh, design professionals, 17% sustainability professionals, 5% natural scientists, 4% health well-being specialists. That's, that's, that's more than I thought. Yeah, that's encouraging number. I, mean, I think especially with the sustainability professionals being brought in early, that is a sign of market transformation. And, and the health and well-being specialists that's something we rarely see, but it's exciting, and I think it's going to start changing more and more. So um, the slide here is is a 
Prospect Park, which is you know, one of Frederick Longstead's greatest designs. So this is not us saying that all standard design processes don't come out with great results, uh, but quite often you don't just get a great park like Prospect Park, you, you end up with a, another strip mall. And a lot of those are because standard design process is rather siloed. You do one part of the project, you turn it over to someone else, and then you go through these iterative uh, steps until you get something uh, provable and buildable. Consultants are added when problems come up. If we run into a, um, we've run into a native dandelion, believe it or not, in Montgomery County, and we have to deal with that. When we found it, if we had brought someone in earlier, we probably could have set up our buffer that we needed uh, right, really early on. And then you think about subsequent steps when those are reached. So you don't think about maintenance until you've already VE'd the project and maybe you didn't actually save money. You, you cost yourself money because a cheaper product is harder to maintain. So an integrative design process is much different. Um, this is a high line in New York that many people are familiar with. Um, stakeholders were involved very early on. There's a whole nonprofit that was involved in, in dealing with the issues of maintenance up front. And whenever you go out there, you see them working. It, it's pretty amazing how this evolved over time. I think it's a very good example, whether it was intentional or not, to create an integrated team. It is a prerequisite for sites in your design process to, to create this integrated team and this integrative design process. There's a lot of collaborative communication, so there's a lot of back and forth between the different professionals. It's based on sustainability principles and performance goals. It's, it brings in stakeholders and the end user early on so that they can help drive some of the issues. This is another picture of the, of the High Line. And construction and, ma and maintenance is considered very early. So one of the things that we've started doing is setting up sustainability goals. And this is important to, to create this integrative design process, but it's also important when we start thinking about um, the actual end design. And as you answer this polling question, I just sort of set up the next part of the talk. Uh, we're starting to see lead ND in particular, but also sites being brought up in the master plans that we work under. So like many municipalities, master plans are developed over a long period of time. And then when they're approved, developers come in and they start working on their project designs to conform to those master plans. And we're seeing lead ND and sites brought up as recommendations in these plans, but not all planners are using them to the best effect in all cases. And there are different approaches that, that we wanna talk about a little bit and how you can integrate those a little bit differently. Steve had mentioned the, the, um, the difference between boundaries, for example, and the different crosswalk elements. And the more planners understand what the focus of the different rating systems are, I think the better they can use them to guide the development pro programs that come along afterwards. We'll just give it another second. And, and like Josh was mentioning about uh, the recommendations uh, to in implement these strategies, sustainability strategies, what's been great to see is how the market or local agencies have adopted a lot of these requirements and credits as, as part of their code. So it's that's where I, I see the market transformation making a big difference is where they became become a, a requirement of a plan submission. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it down and show the results. So let's see. Um, do you set sustainability goals? Yes, for all projects, 10%. Yes, for some projects, 34%. No, but I'd like to, 46%. No, we cannot justify the time and or money, 11%. So we'll try to convince that 11%. Um, 
through through some of these examples. So this this is going to focus a little bit on a project that we're working on now. We're not um, trying to get site certification, but we really looked at the process as we started this. This is a an existing well, it used to be a golf course in Montgomery County, Maryland, in an area called Montgomery Village. It was a golf course since the late well, mid 1960s, and it went bankrupt several years years ago. Uh, not as many people are playing golf anymore, and the village foundation that this that surrounded it really didn't know what to do. So they embarked on a master plan and saw the great potential for this to not only provide a little more housing and a little uh, and, and some park features. Uh, but also, uh, because it has a stream going through it, a great project for a um, restoration. So pre-design really focuses on existing conditions, getting an excellent analysis of what's out there, setting up a team. And this is one where we had an ecologist on site very early, as well as engineers doing their, their work to determine floodplain boundaries, um, the floodway that we had to be concerned with, looking at the ponds, which ones were irrigation ponds, which ones are actually stormwater ponds, uh, dealing with some major utility issues. There are gas lines and PEPCO distribution lines. PEPCO is our local electric service provider uh, lines going through. And then we would typically look at a rating system at this point on um, which makes the most sense. Would this be a a lead, uh, a lead uh, B, D, and C? Probably not, but it might have some kind of other system like Energy Star for the individual homes. Um, sites would have been excellent for this, uh, but we, we were not, not going to pursue it. Setting up opportunities and constraints. You know, so these are all the basic things that you would do in an analysis stage but we really wanted to look at it with a lot of the ecological services, um, ecosystem services early on. Um, so it had opportunities that we saw right away, uh, specifically for, this is Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania, a uh, beautiful meadow, native meadow that they set up outside of their formal garden areas. And so we started looking at precedents like this on where, where would we, where would meadows be more, appropriate than forest area, where would forest area be more appropriate to, to filter water as it gets to the stream, set up the boundary of the environmentally sensitive areas. And because this has master planned uh, roads, our particular project, as well as utilities, we really had to fine tune our approach to be able to implement those roads and utilities and housing at the same time manipulating some of the, the environmentally sensitive areas. Luckily, since it was a golf course, we were only going to be improving the, the situation, but we really had to know what impacts we'd have to floodplain and, and the stream buffer areas that we wanted to save. You run through a test scorecard. So lead ND sites, most lead areas have scorecards, and that's basically a listing of all the prerequisites and credits so that you can start checking off what things you might be able to, to take points for, make sure that you hit the prerequisites, and then you start charretting some of the solutions. And this is where um, during many site walks, you have an ecologist, you have parks maintenance people on there. Um, our charrettes were more back and forth in the field with what kind of things can we do in certain areas? Where do we want to remove golf paths because they, golf cart paths because they, they might impede an area that we wanted to get better floodplain connection to the stream. Where do we want to keep them? Because we want people down in these areas and enjoying them. So their bridges are already there. We might save some of the bridges so that we can have a path through this area. And you're, you're sort of setting up this network of circulation systems. So all of that is thought of early on before we're actually designing the project and where you know, 50%, hopefully a little bit further along with with our entitlement process, and we're still designing the, the area because of all these things. So one of the things we did early on is we set up 
performance goals, and we had a specific sheet in our, um, we were providing the, the landscape architecture uh, schematic development set for this design, as well as the planning entitlement set. And so one of those sheets focused on performance goals, and we had each of these listed out with some, some basic goals underneath each one of them. And it's a little blurry because I was taking this from a submitted PDF. Um, but the top right is our whole sh an excerpt from the whole sheet, and then the bottom right is a piece of that. And you can see we looked at performance goals for water, soils, and vegetation, the social aspects of the site, uh, that's recreation, things like that, what kind of materials we'd start designing with, and we did look through operations management, construction, and then energy issues, what kind of lighting, what kind of um, are we going to put charging stations in parks? For example, if we are, can we find charging stations that are run on solar uh, photovoltaic systems? Are we going to use LED lights in our in our lightings? So, whoops. So we set those kind of things up. We laid it out as a pre-design set of goals. And it really guides the discussion after that, that we have with parks, with the planning department and other agencies, and with our with the, the design team, as well as the client. When the client looks at these, sees that they're reasonable and will have a benefit to them in the long run, it helps. So those are the kind of sustainability goals that we're talking about. We get into a lot more detail when we're actually designing the site. And of course, you can't read the, the top right um, image, which is the program of performance metrics. So we lay out a whole spreadsheet on this to take it to the next step. And even the bottom right, you can't really read. But you can see that we're looking at various, various elements. And then we're looking at those elements in terms of the spaces we're creating, whether it's common open space, like the park, recreation areas which are specifically programmed areas where we'll have playgrounds and we'll have dog parks things like that roads and parking those are those are spaces that we're designing and those spaces need to consider various um, sustainable sustainability aspects the different components within those spaces for example the recreation areas will have play features furnishings plantings and then the larger systems, how are we dealing with circulation? And that's when we really started talking about which golf, golf cart paths are we going to create or save? Which are we going to remove? Where are we going to create new shared use paths for, for bikers as well as pedestrians? Uh, how are we going to deal with a stormwater and drainage system given that we've got the, the low spot of what turned out to be a several hundred acre um, drainage area? All of that comes through our site. So how are we going to set up that system to deal with the offsite as well as our onsite? How are we going to deal with forest area? This was a golf course that had very little forest. It, it only had actually a little smattering near one of the stormwater ponds. So we're creating um, up to like 30 acres of forest. But how do you set that up with the other components in mind? And then you get into the real specifics. And so going back one slide, these are the component systems and spaces on sort of, I guess, the X, Y axis. And then within each one of those matrix points, you have your specific criteria. And those criteria are going to look at, OK, now we're citing and locating things. Now we're going to talk about the aesthetic qualities of the spaces. What kind of size do they need to be? What kind of capacity do they have to have? And that's whether it's how many kids are going to be in the playground to how many visitor parking spaces we need. What kind of materials? Is it going to be only be asphalt? Or are we going to look at impervious um, or impervious paving? Um, and we get geotechs involved. What kind of, you know, what, what kind of stormwater is going to actually infiltrate into the ground? Is it worth that? Is it worth putting pervious paving on? The functional relationships between the two, the coordination between disciplines is constant, but we very carefully lay out who is going to be talk, who has to talk to whom before you make a decision. So don't decide on bending the creek one way before, talk, before talking to the ecologists, the parks maintenance guys, and, and everyone else. And then infrastructure needs. Where are the specific roads and utilities that are necessary to support all this going to go?
So design management is, um, this is actually talking about how you're managing your design process. And very early on in these conversations, we're assigning different roles and responsibilities. And those will be who's going to lay out this area of, of, the, um, of the housing portion of the project. And we worked with Torty Gallus, the architects and planners on that piece. Who's going to start talking about where the um, where the stream is going to be restored and changed? And we're talking to the ecologists and the parks people about that. Um, this image is is of Crosby Arboretum, which is down in Mississippi, a very early project that was a, a, a basically a conservation project that that shows a lot of different um, habitats in that area. And, and was a brilliant example of the, the architect coming in, designing buildings and spaces for specific functions, the landscape architects designing a path system and, and uh, the, the natural systems around that. And um, their, their process really set, set a bar for how you can manage the design process. Regular work sessions are necessary and then progress against goals the risks and constraints with the client. Um, I can't tell you how many um, check-ins we had and revisions rounds we had with this project. We're still we're still doing them. So now we're going to talk about a little bit of the um, specific credits, so you can get a feel for the kind of things you'll be dealing with when you make recommendations about these. The things that the designer is and planners and and the developers are actually dealing with in a more detailed way. So location is me. So location is um, location has a, a couple things. Lead ND has preferred locations credit, and sites has a locate projects with an existing developed area. The top right slide is uh, the yards down in down on the Anacostia River in DC, and the bottom right is Canal Park in and very close to the yards, actually a couple blocks away in southeast DC. So these are the kind of things that, that we'll start looking at when we're analyzing a project with, for whether or not it can fit into lead ND or sites. Lead ND to get credits of up to five points. You, you can develop uh, the project in an infill area, pre-developed site. Um, that typically means that it's not in its natural state. It has um, buildings parking on, over most of the site. Or you can take points for whether or not you have a certain level of connectivity. And Lead ND measures connectivity by intersection, the number of intersections per area. And so if you have high, high intersection um, rating, you've got high connectivity and can get a lot of points. High priority location and affordability. Lead ND puts these two things together. High priority locations are those things like um, smart growth areas, um, priority development areas that are established by uh, local or regional or state jurisdictions, but they, require you to actually have an affordable housing component in that so that um, issues, they don't directly speak to it, but like gentrification are taken into consideration and affordability is the way to create, get your highest number of points in lead ND. Sites is a little bit different. It does focus on infill sites, but you also have to meet um, basic infrastructure issues like you have to be near existing water and sewer service so that you're not um, expanding the water and sewer envelope that a growth restriction boundary might set up. And you also have to be within at least half a mile of seven basic services. And those are specifically defined. And I think they're the same or basically the same for both rating systems. Those are things like a uh, post office or a library or a retail or restaurant, those kind of things. So sites is a little bit more, a little bit harder to qualify for, um, but you, you get the four points. 
So when, when you're laying these things out and testing them, early mapping is, is very important. Site visits are very important. You have to make sure that walking distance doesn't have gaps in them. Sometimes even Google, Google Maps will show you a walking path, but it's not really a, a, an accessible path and it does not have sidewalks all the way. Um, you have to look at those look, you have to look at the basic services because they're counted by their entrance and they can't be all, they can't all be within the same buildings. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of site investigation to do. You need to start mapping out your infill and doing um, percent. Uh, it, it's all calculated by by the percent of the area and infill and adjacent properties. It gets it gets a little bit complicated, but you need to map that early and finding whether or not you're within the defined developed area. Um, lead ND is a little stricter than sites in this case. Lead ND requires that the entire site must be previously developed whereas sites, the 75% must be previously developed because it does take into consideration existing natural features, uh, which you can then get points for, for maintaining or restoring. So this, this particular credit comparison looks at lead in D, uh, street line and shaded streetscapes and the sites uh, credit uh, reduce urban heat island effects. Um, now the intent between lead and D credit is, is very broad in scope. The goals are to provide shade and reduce cooling demands that are typically higher in urban environments. Additionally, the credit intent is to provide trees to retain water, slow runoff, provide for wildlife habitat, sequester carbon, remove gaseous pollutants, slow traffic, promote walking, and improve safety for, for pedestrians. I mean, that's a, that's a tall order on trees, but they, they do a lot of heavy environmental lifting for us. Um, there are, are two options with this credit the project team can consider. Option one is to provide uh, trees along 60% uh, of the total walking block areas, you know, existing and proposed, and at intervals of no more than 50 feet on center, so it's somewhat prescriptive in terms of spacing. Option two is designed to allow teams to combine 10-year tree canopy growth with shade structures such as awnings, pergolas, PV panels that provide for at least 40% coverage of the existing plan blocks. And, and that credit's somewhat closer to the site's credit. Um, the, the site's credit intent is to minimize the effects on microclimate and human and wildlife habitat by using vegetation and highly reflective materials to reduce urban heat island effects. You know, this credit expands the options for the team by using paving and roofing materials with high reflectance characteristics, as well as trees and vegetated roofs. Generally, in this particular credit, trees should shade about 50% of the paved area, and paving, paved areas should have a, a low solar reflectance, or I'm sorry, high solar reflectance index of, you know, 33 or lower. And I think what they do, they get a little bit more specific on the pavement is so new new pavement would be 28 percent sr value with an aged value of 33 so it, it gets a little more specific so real solar reflectance for those who don't know is the the higher the value the more light is sunlight is reflected and therefore the more the urban heat island is re effect is reduced yeah and, and by using you know vegetated roofs uh, white epdm roofing uh, pavements with a high, a, a low solar reflectance index, and tree canopy. Uh, it, it provides you a lot of a lot of flexibility to work with with all those elements. Now, taking the site's uh, language and applying it to lead ND would be tough with trees spaced at 50 feet on center. So you have to add a little bit more rigor to your to your site when you're limited to streetscapes. Uh, so that that could help you with that. Uh, that achievement, and you know, earlier we talked about how we showed how lead could earn sites and sites could earn lead. This is where these considerations really come into to play when making those evaluations. And some of the you know typical conflicts that that we have to deal with at, at the detail level, um, you know, when you're dealing with local guidelines and species restrictions. Um, underground utilities, overhead restrictions, uh, you know, poor urban soils, 
uh, these are a lot of the situations that get you know, a little more tricky to try to manage on, on any site, let alone a lead ND site. The next uh, credit comparison it would be uh, the lead ND4 community outreach and involvement credit and the sites engage you users and stakeholders credit. These two credits again have a similar goal to bring teams together early on and to get the community buy-in at an early stage. The lead ND credit community outreach and involvement is to encourage responsiveness to community needs by involving the people who live or work in the community in projects design and planning decisions about how the project should be improved or changed over time. The two options in this credit hopefully produce the same result, but provide some flexibility for the design teams and the community. Option one providing, provides, uh, is providing presentations from pre-design through preliminary design to the stakeholders, while option two uh, engages stakeholders through a design charrette, so it provides some flexibility there. The site uh, system has a little more rigor in the stakeholder engagement process. In addition to presenting the design phases from pre-design phase through design development phase, the project must be presented in at least two forms, either website, community meetings, newspapers, or civic displays. And also, at each of these interactions with the public, the summaries of the feedback from the community must also be submitted. And these are just some of the different options that you can use to engage the community. And this, either of these, any of these strategies will work with, with both rating systems. One thing that I'll, I'll chime in on for this, if you're actually doing running a master plan process and you're starting to talk to uh, the stakeholders, whether it's property owners, it's the local community or developers, you may want to consider offering this part of the process process as a piece that they can use in their puzzle if they're going to go after any of these credentialing or um, rating system credits because then they, they could then work this into their design process and it'll be a more collaborative process as you then go on to the actual approval of a master plan and the development review phase. The last two credit comparisons we're going to look at is the lead in lead in the restoration of habitat or wetlands and water bodies credit and the sites restore aquatic ecosystems credit. Now the lead in the credit site for design and habitat, the, the intent of this one is to conserve native plants, wildlife habitat, and water bodies. Ideally a site will be selected that does not have significant habitat and this is probably more the case with lead in D. If the site does, there are two compliance paths to follow. Option one is to delineate significant habitats with the help of state or local environmental agencies and preserve these through easement establishment or either to donate the land to a land trust. Option two addresses sites with wetlands or water bodies. The design here should conserve and protect all water bodies and or wetlands within 100 feet of the water bodies or 50 feet within wetlands. Under the site credit, restore aquatic ecosystems. The intent here is to support healthy, functioning aquatic ecosystems for fish, other wildlife, and people to restore ecological function of damaged, degraded, or destroyed ecosystems. An example we saw earlier was a destroyed or damaged aquatic ecosystem that was that channelized stream that we saw. And, and by doing that, by restoring it to its original path, uh, you know, we help provide more habitat, slow the runoff of water, and also provide resilience, you know, in helping to mitigate, you know, increased storms. Now we're providing a path for more water to soak in and to slow down. And these, that's some of the general. Again, I think you to see a pat, you see a pattern between a comparison that, that the sites credit is is uh, more ecosystem focused, and by taking sites and lead ND and working together, I think you can you can come out with a, a with a stellar project that achieves a lot of, a lot of sustainability goals. And, and here's a listing of some of the some of the teams you would have early on uh, in doing your site analysis. It, it's quite a quite an army of, of, of folks, and I know the one of the bigger challenges is is to have your client engaged 
to engage financially these professionals up front. And I, I think, you know, it's our jobs to convince our clients that, you know, this investment up front uh, creates a, a lot of savings, not just for the community, but, but for the environment in, in general. I think the last, the last thing I'll say on this slide and then we'll, we're done is that in, in the case that I was talking about with the golf course, a lot of these people were not only consultants that the, the client brought in, they were also the agency representatives. So many of the people from the parks Depart Department of Parks and the Planning Department are ecologists or, or landscape architects um, or horticulturalists. So they were in on a lot of the, the site work early on. And so it wasn't something that had to be pay for, paid for per se, but we all got the benefit of their knowledge base and could work towards the, the solution um, together. So that's um, that's our contact information, and we'll now open it up to Q and A and um, try to answer your questions as best we can. Great. <clears throat> okay, folks. And remember, you can type your questions in the chat box in the uh, webinar toolbar on the right of your screen. First question: <clears throat> Do you know of a good example or model sustainability resiliency plan element or component? that's adopted as part of a community's comprehensive or master plan, along with other element components, um, including like land use, transportation, things like that. Um, there, uh, there are a couple, a couple answers to that. One, we the jurisdictions around DC in particular and in Maryland and Virginia, because we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, the master plans and area plans, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, they're called different things. They have very strong sustainability elements. And the downtown Bethesda plan is Bethesda, Maryland, is one that recently got ado adopted that specifically looked at lead ND early on and has recommendations to look at sites principles. And I spent this morning writing up how we respond in one of our projects to the site's principles to show conformance with that master plan. Those are, those are good examples, the area plans. Um, so if you looked at Montgomery Planning Department's website in the community section of their website, they have a lot of master plans and the more recently adopted ones uh, do reflect these issues. And they also have the transportation elements and recreation elements those aspects. The other thing is that LEED ND, um, I guess USGBC has actually put out a, um, a, a floating zone, a, so a you know, non Euclidean zone, a floating zone, the, those zones that can be asked for project by project, um, depending on your jurisdiction. They've released a document that lays out a, um, an example zoning ordinance for for that lead ND uh, plan development that can be asked for and that is uh, available on their website it's what um, it's actually what Montgomery County when I was there writing zoning ordinance pieces we wrote into the zoning code our floating zones are based on that that system so that's a zoning ordinance element that specifically talks about floating zones in terms of larger sustainability issues. And the District of Columbia recently was designated as a lead platinum city. I believe it was the first by USGBC. And that's largely to do, I believe, with the green area ratio requirement that the District of Columbia has. And that green area ratio is, is, is required for all new construction. And it basically, it's designed to make the city more spongy, being being right adjacent to Potomac and Anacostia rivers and part of the a larger Chesapeake Bay watershed, it's it's uh, been a huge uh, re regulatory improvement for the city and, and a great model for other cities to follow. It's similar to Seattle, and they, they've done a great green area right. program also. Hope we answered the question. Um, great. Uh, before I go to the next question, um, some folks are using the raise your hand function. Um, 
we don't give voice privileges, so if you have a question, type it in that chat box. Don't raise your hand. Um, okay, next question. Uh, towards the end of your presentation, you were talking about uh, shade trees, um, and the question is, merchants need to be seen. Do shade tree requirements conflict with their needs? Yes and no. We, we do get that question a lot, and for example, we, we typically switch our plant species depending on whether or not we have retail frontage, and we do it one of two ways. We do smaller trees if you're not al allowed or able to underground utilities, you have to use small trees anyway. Those are a little bit more problematic because their canopy is lower because they're meant not to grow up into the overhead lines. And so you may have to look at spacing issues or very careful um, location of your awnings and signage based on your plant spacing. The other thing we do where we're not restricted by overhead uh, lines or overhangs of or those, those issues, we, we change out our plant species. For example, Zelkova, um, does Zelkova have a common name? No, I don't think so. Zelkova, Japanese Zelkova, was used in a lot of streetscapes and retailers hated it because it has a vase-shaped um, canopy habit at the base and, and limbing it up makes it look very strange. And so we use species that we can put in at a large caliper. So typically they're already four inches or bigger and we limb them up at a minimum of eight feet, if not more. And over time, especially certain oaks, uh, London plane trees, those kind of things have a very high broad canopy that we can limb up to get your awning and signage visibility, which is typically in the 10 to 15 foot range. Um, but it does take time. And most of the time, we're just hoping that the improved environment is what creates the foot traffic, which then actually increases sales. And we haven't seen any real data on on actual impacts. It's more of a perceived impact, sort of like parallel parking, teaser parking in front of things. Street trees are the same thing. We don't know that they actually have it, but a lot of retailers think they do. Right. And it, it takes a lot of salesmanship as, as a designer up front to sell this to those who are concerned about obscuring the sign bands. But there's some data through the Urban Land Institute that, that promotes the increase in retail on, on walkable streets with nice tree-lined tree uh, alleys. So that's, there's, there's data back out there. You know, the, the 2005 Millennium Ecosystem Assessment also provides a lot of good numerical financial data they, that was done with the with about 1,200 scientists, and they actually decided to to take data they had and turn it into financial numbers, which is I think appeals to a lot of people in, in certain certain arenas, especially developers. Okay, next question. Um, I work for a oh, this is a good question. I work for a municipality, and I'd like to conduct a self-scoring exercise for our downtown neighborhoods as part of a public awareness initiative for a more sustainable and walkable downtown. Are there any toolkits municipalities can use to assess their existing neighborhoods? You know, something something I saw recently in the, the city of Tacoma Park was an early uh, outreach. Uh, meeting with the community and what they did was they had boards up with images different images just a wide array of, of uh, street street side character a retail storefront and they gave the uh, participants uh, just stick on dots and they kind of walked walked around and tagged the images that were more, more appealing to them and I think that was a it was a really successful uh, display to watch the community was very engaged. They they had they would huddle around an image and talk to each other. So it started a, a lot of uh, debate, some good, some bad. But it was a, having images. I think really captured the attention of the community and gave the design team in the city a, a great idea of what what uh, the community was looking for. I don't know what Josh. Have you seen other methods that have been successful? Was is the question more related to? Assessing existing conditions or assessing the 
public and, and maybe the political bodies, their um, interest in moving in a more sustainable direction? Um, existing conditions. And with that, you would probably have to do some, sit down with your GIS folks and do some specific mapping and testing of the rating system. I think the rating systems themselves are free, right? You can download the rating systems and you can test them out uh, credit by credit, go through them. And the um, scorecards are available for free. There's a much larger reference guide for each of this each of these rating systems as well as the old lead other lead systems that's available for a, a fee it's a, a couple hundred dollars actually um, but the rating systems are available and you can score them yourself or you know you, you could always get a um, possibly a grant but maybe some funding to to get a consultant to work with you on rating rating the system or rating your, your, your downtown against one of the systems. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, which sector has been the best at implementing green building standards? For instance, commercial development, multifamily, office, school, university, government buildings. Government buildings are certainly high on the list because it's mandated and I pretty sure that uh, sites rating, at least site certification is required by GSA now at the federal level. Our local um, transit authority, the WMATA, Washington Metropolitan something, 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 they, they require redevelopment of their um, metro sites at each station that they redevelop to be LEED and D certified. Um, so public agencies are are high on the list. Most of what we work on are mixed use infill developments that rate very highly and have pursued lead ND because they're they're trio, TOD smart growth areas. Um, sites is I've seen a lot in um, nonprofit agencies, universities, and institutions um, because they because they have land and they and they can do interesting things on campuses and um, especially botanic gardens and things like that. But I, I don't know uh, if there's a really much in the specifically single-use commercial or residential area in either of these. Yeah, agreed. That's that's the beauty of the uh, menu of rating systems to choose from. Okay, next question. Can canopy palms be used to obtain the shade requirement? Also, most trees, with the exception of evergreen trees, lose their leaves for part of the year. How is this taken into consideration when measuring the shade requirement? So a, a, lot, of, a lot of locales in, in our area give you a 10-year a canopy spread based on the, the tree type. And the uh, sites rating system and the lead rating systems both allow you to take credit for the shade that a tree cast at that 10-year growth and they, they want you to use in terms of the, the sun angle and the time of the year um, the summer solstice time you average the shade it casts from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. so you're you're getting more than just the canopy itself you're getting the shadow that that moves from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So, you know, you, there's modeling software out there, even simple ones like SketchUp, that can provide you that, that data. Yeah, and whether it's deciduous or not, it, that, that doesn't matter. In, in a lot of climates, you actually want the, the solar during, during the winter. Heat gain during the winter, right. Um, okay, thanks. Next question. <clears throat> City council members all have different definitions of sustainability. Is there somewhere an official definition of sustainability? Well, one of the one of the things that we would say based on this discussion specifically is that these rating systems 
define it by if you do these things, you get certified as a sustainable development, whether it's through lead ND or sites or something else. So they sites in particular is specifically meant to define what a sustainable site is and set a baseline that you can then build off of. Um, and as we've seen with LEED, LEED has changed significantly since it was originally um, developed. Something that was certified 10 years ago couldn't even get close now. It, it moves the bar. So these are, these are systems that allow you to define sustainability, but then there are other definitions out there. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of a lot of greenwashing, if you will, and again, the, the beauty the beauty of a rating system following that is, like Josh said, the rating systems are updated. Um, there's a lot a lot of cross pollination from one rating system to the other, like we showed here today. But I think one of the most fascinating goals by USDBC with with the lead B, D, and C credit is their goal uh, by 2030 of lead certification, which is the low level, being a net zero building. And, you know, 10 years ago, I thought that was a far reach, but, you know, with rating systems such as the living filling challenge and, and climates that I thought would be impossible to achieve that, like Atlanta, you know, people are, people are achieving those goals now and, and they're, you know, they're, they're, bla they're blazing the trail for the rest of us. So there's, there's a lot of great case studies out there and, and the USCBC website is a, is a great resource to, to look at a lot of these case studies. I can't remember the author, but I'm in the middle of a book called Sustainability, Sustainability, Planning for Sustainability, um, which is is quite interesting because it does look at, it looks at it from a pers planning perspective, and it goes back into um, comparing things, the rational planning method, and 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 all the way through to Marxist theory and things. But it does. The, the author does actually lay out a specific definition, and then he builds his his case on his theory of sustainability. And it's a it's a good comparison tool and good resource to look at planning more hol holistically from the sustainability perspective. So that that's one piece you might want to look at. Thank you. Next question: um, <clears throat> Is it worthwhile and if so why um for planners to get the lead ap nd credential um i i think it's the the most applicable for planners and at least in the jurisdictions that we work in around washington dc northern virginia um suburban maryland it has proved valuable to, to our approach to planning because most of our master plans focus on smart growth, transit-oriented development, and, um, and green buildings. Maryland or Montgomery County, which we work 50% you know, of the, our firm's work is in, just adopted the International Green Construction Code. So that kind of takes care of the building piece of it. Um, not much of the site or planning piece of it. And I find if nothing else, it has changed the way I can speak to planning issues with clients and with agencies to to really get them focused on the the actual sustainable elements of of design rather than um, the things that are more like like Steve mentioned, greenwashing issues. Uh, so I, I think it has helped, at least from my design and planning perspective. Yeah. yeah, the credential itself, you know, following your name may or may not help you. Depends on what market you're in. But you know, hands down, the the uh, education and insight uh, learned by going through the process is is really the most valuable part of it. Okay. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Um, so we did pretty good today. Thank you, uh, Josh and Steve, for, for joining us today in the National Capital Area uh, chapter for hosting today's session. Um, it is just now the PDF is posted to 
uh, our webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Um, and we'll, we'll get a recording of this up on our YouTube channel shortly. Uh, so again, thanks to both of you and National Capital and everyone. We will talk next time. Have a good weekend. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.